Hey there, Commanders. The ship that I've put together this week is one that actually I forgot I even had. Uh, this has been sitting in storage on my home station forever, and then I put it on my fleet carrier without even really thinking about what it was. Um, I, the first iteration of this build is actually more than a year old. And uh, the other night I got it out and started fighting with it again and found it to still be you know, reasonably relevant, if just a little bit mistuned. So I've gone in and made some adjustments, and I want to go over it here for our ship build this week. Because there's a common misconception among the Elite Dangerous community that Thargoid ships have to be expensive. they got to be these medium and large ships, like the Anaconda, or the Cutter, the Crate, the Chieftain. And while those are very popular options, and I do recommend them for high-level Thargoid fights, you don't need to break the bank to be a, a good AX pilot. In fact, some of the smaller, cheaper ships excel at specific tasks, and the Viper is definitely one of these ships that gets overlooked fairly often by the Greater Elite Dangerous community, and it's not that expensive to build. Uh, this is 3.4 mil, a little more than, actually, but it's um, it does require a lot of time investment in farming Guardian materials and getting all of your engineers unlocked. Uh, and it is a build that I recommend you try to get as much engineering and uh, Guardian stuff done before you try to use it because you'll they're a key to the build's effectiveness and success. I'll go over it in just a second, uh, but I do want to mention too that um, AX combat is one of the more intimidating aspects of Elite Dangerous. It's often treated as end game content, and in some respects it is. If you want to go fight a Hydra solo, that's definitely end game. But if you want to tag along with AXI and an AXCZ, you, you don't need all that much fancy equipment in order to do it, and it's a great way to make credits right now. Uh, the group I was with wasn't really trying all that hard, and we were netting just a little north of 100 million credits an hour, and it was a lot more engaging than mining Painite or doing the road to riches. It is risky. You are putting your ships in jeopardy, so you should make sure you've always got your rebuys lined up. But played right, it's a very effective way to make money, and it's a very good career path for people who want to get into combat, especially high-level PvE combat. And uh, you don't have to worry about PvP as much because, especially if, with your, if you're with the AXI, they've got private groups set up and it's all worked out so that you can uh, just set up a, a good hour or two long grind and pound out those credits. So I'll get into it now. Uh, there are several places in this build where you can make changes that uh, alter its performance to your particular tastes. But one of the essential aspects of the Viper you should try not to lose is its boost speed. Now you do sacrifice hull integrity to do that, but even if you manage to get this thing up to 2,000 absolute hull, you know, the Thargon Swarm is going to kill you if you're not on your toes. And it only takes one or two good passes to scrub you. One pass, actually, if you're not moving and you get caught with your, uh, with your pants down. Uh, now, you could choose between lightweight alloy and military-grade composite. If you do military-grade composite, then I recommend uh, lightweight because it does still get you a little bit better in deep plating. You can go with uh, heavy weight, heavy duty, um, but it does make your ship a lot heavier. It takes you all the way down. You lose uh, about nine meters per second of boost, which you know some people are willing to do. It gets you up to eighteen hundred, and that does give you a little bit more resilience if you uh, if you make a mistake and the Thargon Swarm manages to get you caught up. But uh, that, that is, I want to emphasize that this Viper is not for general AX combat. This Viper is highly specialized to fight Thargons specifically. And it's, th it's something that small ships are really good at. But the Viper and the Colbert III and the, um, the Diamondback Scout are all capable of running this hardpoint loadout. But the Viper is the fastest and the most maneuverable. So of those available options, I highly recommend you go with the Viper. Um, but you can do the Cobra 3, although its larger exposed cross-section when you corner means that the Thargons are going to have more opportunities to hit you, so you got to plan around that. Uh, let's see. Power plant is armored, grade 5, and monstered. The previous iteration of this build was overcharged, and I would found that it only takes a, a couple of direct hits from a suiciding Thargon to scrub your power plant down to, you know, like 70 or 60 percent, and then you start having power plant malfunctions, and your available power band goes down and it, and it just makes life a little miserable. So I don't recommend you do anything but armor it because the Viper makes a lousy shield tank and um, well 
The Viper is... I should... I mean, I'm going to correct that, actually. The Viper can be a shield tank, but you don't necessarily uh, want to shield tank at the cost of whole integrity, especially when you're dealing with... Um... You know what? I'm going to amend that again, actually. That is something I could play with, because you could... You could get a lighter weight hull and still maintain enough uh, absolute. The Thargon swarms uh, have shield penetrating weapons, so you do have to make sure that your hull is not made of tissue paper because even a cough could kill you at that point. But um, I'll, I'll come back and revisit a shield tank viper sometime later. Uh, let's see. I'm planning on doing increased rain or uh, a faster boot sequence on my viper because I have a fleet carrier and I don't worry about jump range all that much. Uh, but if you don't have a fleet carrier, increased range is going to help you out. 2A life support, lightweight, because the uh, you're dealing with suiciding Targons. That's a combination of explosive and absolute damage. So you want to make sure that you uh, you have time to think, because if they head on you, your cockpit canopy is going to blow out. You want to have that 25 minutes to think about what's going to happen and what you got to do to get out of there. Charge enhance for obvious reasons. Super conduits also for obvious reasons. Um, Goss cannons are power hungry, you want to keep them well fed, and bioweaves love to abuse your capacitor, so I try to tamp that down a little bit by making the uh, bioweave enhance low power and low draw. Uh, let's see, 3D sensors for weight control, long range grade 5, makes them a little bit heavier, but not as much as the A rated one would be. Uh, all the whole reinforcement packages are heavy duty deep plating, I could come back in and lightweight these probably to, to get some poundage back, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. Uh, I have two AFMs on here because, again, explosive damage wrecks your internal, your, your externals, so your hardpoints and your utilities, and it can do a lot of uh, damage to your internals depending on where the Thargon Swarm hits you. So you want to make sure that your AFMs are... You want to make sure you have something to deal with that. You can do that with... I think the AFM is probably the best way to deal with it, but if you want to throw whole reinforcement packages or Guardian stuff in here, you can also do that. Just know that you, you're probably going to start dealing with weapon malfunctions and longer form fights. The remote release flak launchers are really the center of this build. They're, they're the magic that makes it all happen. They're not a very popular weapon, but they're the only weapon that kills Thargons. Nothing else can do it. But the low shot speed and uh, remote release system mean that you have to be really close for your bullets to do anything. And ideally, you want to be hitting the swarm when it's in clustered formation. Uh, it has two principal formations that it will run in. Cl clustered is for rapid transit across the battlefield, and then circle formation is when it finds a target that it wants to kill. It will form a ring, actually also called ring formation, and it will just pelt a target with bullets. And at some point too in that, depending on how pissed off the interceptor is, it will start spawning missiles and, and causing all kinds of trouble. Uh, the Guardian Goss cannons are optional per se, um, if you aren't going to run Gauss Cannons, I recommend running Advanced Multi Cannons so you can still get AX damage on the Interceptors. You want to at least be able to tag the Interceptors so that you get credit on the bounties when they uh, when they go down. And Utility Mounts. All new AX pilots should be running a Shutdown Field Neutralizer, and that Neutralizer should be on a primary hardpoint group where you can click a button and hold it. Uh, I don't use hotkeys for Shutdown Field Neutralizers. I don't, I'm not sure if there is one. I don't tend to trust them. I want to be able to have this thing where I can look at it and see that it's charging and doing what it says it's going to do. Um, Xeno Scanner, however, is optional. This build doesn't need one to be effective, although the Viper applies the Xeno Scanner better than most anti Thargoid ships. Because of its maneuverability, you can go in and get scans where the larger ships have a hard time. So I have it on for wing combat purposes, even though, um, technically speaking, the Gauss Cannons. Uh, hit scan weapon means that uh, you don't really need to have sub targeting for them to be effective against Thargoid Hearts. But it is convenient for your wingmates, and it does give you the ability to see individual Thargoid Heart integrity, which is helpful. Uh, power is tight on this build, so you need to be running power management to get everything going right. Here you can see the spread that I have for uh, calculated power. Um, to make this work right, I had to E rate the Guardian module reinforcement package. If you're willing to make some more sacrifices, you can derate it, but it does mean that you lose your uh, group three, so in this case, the cargo hatch and the Xeno scanner. All that means is you have to retract your hard points to get a Xeno scan or a scoop with Argoid Heart, which isn't too bad, but um, I, as a personal taste, prefer to keep power management relatively confined, just so you know what I'm talking about. 
Um, I could disable the AFMs, for example, and not need to do any power management whatsoever. I prefer setups like that. Um, I'm going to end up running with them enabled, and then if they run out of ammo or I run out of synthesis, I'll, uh, I can disable them in combat and get a little bit, um, a little bit more freedom on the reactor. That's this build in a nutshell. Um, I will say that this is actually really fun, and if you set this up right, um, you can joust a Thargoid Swarm, where none of the other uh, medium and large ships have the ability to do that. You can get right on the Swarm's tail, you can put remote release flak right into the middle of their formations without jeopardizing yourself, especially if you're not going to do FA off boost turns. Uh, the Swarm can barely get shots off on you. You aren't going to take a lot of damage as long as you stay on the move, and staying on the move is key to success with this build. It puts a lot of pressure on you as the pilot to be effective, and it will make you a better pilot because you'll have to be planning all of your moves in advance. You have to be anticipating the swarm. You have to be keeping an eye on what all of your wingmates are doing. Um, if you end up colliding with the wingmate, you're going to take a lot of damage, and it sucks. But your hull integrity is low enough that their repair limpets can make a difference if they're carrying them, and with Gauss cannons, you do have the ability to readily overheat if you take a caustic missile to the face or otherwise suffer caustic damage incidental to something else that you're doing. Uh, the shields, um, I might get criticized for running uh, low power and low draw, but the recovery recharge time is, is just beautiful. It gets you an easy extra 50 megajoules of shield power back every 30 seconds if they go down. And it only takes a little over a minute to charge the whole thing back up to full power, which I absolutely love. That means if the shields ever pop, you know, you need to you know, back up a little bit, take your distance, take a deep breath, maybe fix some modules for one minute while everything comes back online. But it does also give you some ability to anticipate surprises because that Thargon Swarm is really sneaky. These, these little drones are super dangerous. Don't underestimate them. Uh, fully equipped Hydra Swarm. If you want to go back and look at my Type 10 anti-scout build, you can see just how much damage those damn things can put out. They will strip large shields. They will eat entire shield cell banks worth of um, 8B shield cell output. Um, they'll, they'll absolutely peel the shields off of large ships in seconds. Um, so uh, that, that puts the iotis on you and your little viper to make sure that you know what they're doing. And if you do happen to see your shields start to flare, hit that boost button and crank it hard. Because if your shields pop and you're not on the move, this 1600 hull is going to vanish like a fart in the wind, even with all the engineering that's on here. Um, but on the upswing, the ship only costs 173000 to rebuy. It's dirt cheap, so it's the perfect ship to learn, and learn you will. When you're fighting Thargoids in this ship, you should expect to throw several of these in a single night at, at different targets. And as you get better, eventually you're going to get to the point where you can do hour-long, two-hour-long fights in this ship and not die, even as you're engaging targets that are a lot more threatening than you are. And if you happen to lose, well, you're only at 173k, which is chump change for most commanders, and it means that you don't have to feel bad if you die while you're learning. At least not as bad as you do in something like a crate or a chieftain where you might be throwing, you know, nine or ten million dollars in a rebuy. Sometimes more, depending on the application. Anyway, uh, that is this build in a nutshell. If you guys want any more information about it or have any questions, let me know in the comments. And uh, if you have any ideas for another video, also let me know and I'll see if I can get to it. I'll catch you later.